It's being recorded now, so we can start. Okay, so hi all, welcome to the first lecture, uh, Salsa Lecture in 2021. Uh, my name is Alex and I'm your Salsa Lecture representative, uh, together with Tanya. Yeah, I'm also a lecture representative for Salsa. Um, and basically this lecture series is uh, a part of WSA's student association and we try to organize some lectures just to engage the community in more discussions and today we're happy to have Hayes Ricken um, from MVDR, MVRDV, so I'm a little bit nervous, who is the associate design director and he's going to be speaking to us about history and context, green high rises and how to practice sustainability in the real world and so we're hoping that it'll be a really cool discussion he has some really good things to say um and we hope that you enjoy so thank you so much for joining us today by the way and just a few quick rules uh there's going to be a q a at the very end so feel free to drop questions throughout the lecture in the chat box and we're going to go for them at the end so yeah make sure you make the most out of it and now we'll head off to our speaker <laughs> all right uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Great to be here and great to be able to tell you these stories that I've got lined up for you today. Um, it has a considerable length, but um, I hope to not bore by um, having mostly images actually and no text to show you all. Um, so again, thanks for being here. Um, today I want to talk indeed about history and the context uh, in an architectural sense that is. Uh, some projects on green high rises indeed and sustainability will be part of the uh, presentation as well. Um, I'll start with a tiny introduction of what MVRDV actually is and stands for also. So MVRDV is Maas van Rijs de Vries. That's the three surnames of the founding principles of the office, uh, which was founded already uh, almost 30 years ago now. Um, we are currently a office of 270 people. We originate in Rotterdam and we do projects more or less all over the world currently. Um, through various studios and also satellite offices that we have. Uh, but our home base is still Rotterdam, where we started and where we have an office that is um, trying to express the way in which we have our uh, architectural uh, convictions. So it's an open space, it's a social space, it's a space where we come together to, to do our work and to try to always come up with that new thing and that new design in a collaborative fashion. Um, so the project's a bit of an introduction of what we do. So more or less the office started with this project back in 1993 already, which was an office building in Hilversum in the Netherlands. But the brief was actually to come to a design uh, by combining a lot of different small offices throughout the city into one big office for this broadcasting company. And the MVRDV was back then only, I think, four or five people. Um, and we actually more or less bluffed our way through the competition by having some friends coming over, actually sitting behind desks and pretending to be actually employees and workers so that the, uh, the client would actually be convinced that we were an up and running office that could take on such a big project. And we managed to secure it and create this fascinating office building with voids and continuous floor case and ceilings that give this fantastic interior spaces. And that is still a kind of porous block on which a lot of our studies later on have still been based. From that, it went quite quickly. We did the Hanover Pavilion in 2000 for the Netherlands, where we made a stacked landscape that actually combines all the landscapes of the Netherlands into one big tourist attraction, which was a big hit. So here you see inside the building, the forest that we have, and on top, this landscape, this kind of polder landscape that we have with windmills and water features was very much representative of the Netherlands. And we kept on going, developing this narrative of ours. We actually built the concept diagram to make the diagram into a literal building here, flipping a typical Barcelona block onto its side to make sure that the densified, uh, this area of the city could be densified and that this public place, space at that height could be realized up top. And densification kept on being a topic here. So also by putting this extension on top of a building in the center of Rotterdam to make sure that these people would not flee actually to the suburbs, but would be able to have their um, family be enlarged, have more kids actually, and get more room within the city center itself. Um, we've done some stuff in the UK as well. Uh, we were selected to design the Serpentine Pavilion back in 2004. And we came up with a way to continue Hyde Park over that kind of privatized little bit of gallery that is in the middle of it, trying to also make this public, which gave these beautiful sections and these very nice old school models that we made. Unfortunately, we were not able to build it 
I will come back to that later in the presentation for a bit, since um, recently we have been retrying this concept in the vicinity. Something that we did do build in the end was the balancing barn in Suffolk, where we took one of the uh, more local vernacular styles, extruded that onto a ledge that we found on the site, and installed a nice swing underneath it in a glass floor to have a holiday house um, that people could experience contemporary architecture in and to see if there could be a change maybe made by experiencing this to what people actually wanted for their own homes and their own buildings and their own um, possible projects. Um, and then uh, the office more or less got launched, I think, into a, uh, into a next step, into a next phase by the Markt Hall in Rotterdam, uh, a kind of new typology where we use housing to build an arch. And underneath that arch actually have the market, the fresh food market itself, with people looking down from those windows onto that market uh, and creating this half inside, half outside space that has now become a, uh, a large attraction and still a big hit in the city for everybody. And we kept on working in that sense on bigger scale projects here in Seyou, where we took this old ro road and made this into a completely new green corridor just for the pedestrians. Or here also in Seyou, where we made a, um, a casino, a building without windows that needed entrances nonetheless. So we lifted that building and made openings by just actually morphing the volumetrics of the building and creating passages like that with GRC reinforced concrete panels. Or here the library in Tanjin, where we made this fantastic space on the inside that is a landscape of books, a continuous landscape of books with a nice omni cinema in the middle of it. And finally, something that is almost completed also in Rotterdam, again, the depot, again, a new typology, a building that is actually a, a depot that is publicly accessible. So all the art that is stored in this museum is actually accessible all the way through while it's being stored here instead of it being um, tucked away, maybe in a basement and not being able to see. So a public route weaves through this building and this facade on the outside is made into reflective panels to just imitate and duplicate the skyline of Rotterdam and actually make the park in which it stands almost um, multiplied and doubled up. So all these projects that we do, um, there's not necessarily a style that we work with. It's not necessarily a certain direction that we always go into, apart from that we always try to find something new, something interesting to research and to bring it a step forward. So this idea that we have with the searching for what is next is uh, at the basis of the office um, and to be able to find out what is next and to search for that new thing uh, we always have this drive to innovate and to search for that for that better world uh, and to be able to do that we have to think about the future um, and to be able to think about the future we have to dream and those dreams um, in those dreams we try to be more sustainable for instance we try to be more prototypical, as we say it, or we try to be a little bit more courageous, as we did with the balancing barn, or more critical at the same time. More human, more humorous as well, uh, but also more innovative and contextual at the same time. To be more transparent, in this case, to be more shiny maybe, or self-reflective, and to be more adaptive to the changing world surrounding us. Uh, but how to realize these dreams? That is the big question. How can we dream and then also create these dreams so that we can move on to the next one after that. So we need to analyze, we need to research, and we need to test in order to get more knowledge and to take that new step forward and inform our way forward. So that is why the office uh, is well known for its publications, for the books that we make and that we write um, and that we investigate together with the Y Factory, this research institution at the uh, Technical University of Delft, where we ask these questions about the city of the future uh, to know uh, what would happen if we would want to live underwater or if we want to densify our cities or have more biodiversity or have a, um, a new vertical village kind of city or more porosity in our cities. And with all these questions, um, we are trying to find um, these different um, aspects in which we want to research. And all of these lines of research that we're doing, we're capturing those in a new book, an upcoming book, that is called KM4, in which we want to track how our buildings have been operating um, since they were conceived. So how do they function? How well are they uh, performing? And what can be improved? And these things, these type of researches, we put those along these research lines that we have to see what is next. What is the next step that we can do in glassifying these buildings or in camouflaging these buildings? And today, um, I will talk about a couple of projects that are somewhere along that line of us trying to research and trying to take that next step along those different paths that we uh, 
are intrigued about and that we are interested in as an office. So I will start the story about Glass Farm, a project that is now already almost 10 years old, but still very relevant. So for this presentation, um, and it's um, I call it the hypercontextual object. We'll show you and tell you why. Um, so more often we have been researching um, how to deal with the existing fabrics of a city. So in this case here, where we made a lifted hutong to see if we can keep the existing fabric and still have new, um, new developments also in place. The same actually for the balancing barn. How can we um, combine the old with the new somehow in these styles and combine them? Well, Glass Farm, to be able to tell this story, I need to start with the history. I need to tell you the story about this little village that is in Schijndel in the Netherlands uh, that looked like this uh, around the turn of the previous century. Um, it was a very cute and very typical Dutch little village, nothing much happening there. Um, with these kind of farmhouses and these church buildings here around the church square. Uh, but at some point during the Second World War, there was a moment that this, uh, this little village got bombed. They were caught in a crossfire between, I think, uh, the Germans and the British. And a lot of the buildings around the central market square were actually demolished. And this is how the central street and the market here in the back at that point actually looked. So at some point, the people of Schijndel decided to demolish these buildings and not build them back. And that left them with this super large and very uh, prominent market square within that little town of theirs, slightly out of proportion. And it was a windy place. It was a place uh, that was used for cars mostly. Um, not much was going on there. Uh, so, and the interesting thing is that Schijndel is the birthplace of uh, Vinnie Maas, one of our principal uh, founders of the office. And he wrote actually a letter to the mayor when he was about 20 years old. This was uh, somewhere in the, in the 1980s. And he said, Mr. Mayor, um, this market that we have, it's, it's way too large. Maybe it is a good idea to actually have a architectural competition and see if there's a possibility to fill this gap in the city with something a little bit more appealing. And the mayor actually nicely returned his letter saying, very nice idea, Mr. Maas, but maybe, uh, maybe later we will think about it. So um, then when he got to actually um, found MVRDV, we built this building in Hanover and the mayor actually got back to him saying, oh, that's quite interesting what you're doing there. And it's interesting that you're a resident of this village. So maybe you can do some studies after all. So we started studying uh, back in the old days to see what could be possible here. Uh, in this case, a sunken theater or a floating garden or a kind of market hall predecessor maybe or maybe a, a lifted, a lifted uh, park in the middle of the, uh, of the town square. And at that point, the press, which is a, uh, well, a force to be reckoned with there in the Netherlands, they started to get wind of this. And they said that a UFO had landed on the market in Schijndel. And they were very much against all these wild uh, plans that Winnie had to build here on the market. So of course, a survey was to be held to see what people actually wanted to do. And from that survey, it um, resulted that there wasn't a need for a committee. Of course, in the Netherlands, you need to talk about things. You need to find the middle ground. So a committee was formed. And with that committee, we built a model. And we started to discuss what the building could actually be like on this square. So we took a phone block. We started our modeling, um, um, our modeling there. And we put the phone block in there. And we said, OK, is this a volume that you could maybe possibly find yourself in? And they said, well, maybe it's a little bit too large. We started to decrease it. Maybe this is okay, or maybe even smaller, or even smaller than that. And then said, so, no, maybe that's too small. So we settled in a nice Dutch manner in a uh, in a middle ground way, but also for the depth, of course. Right? What depth is okay? And then they said, this is maybe not deep enough, and this is too deep. So somewhere in the middle, maybe could still work to have shops and offices. And then at some point, they said, well, we also need to make sure that there was enough light on the street and on the square right next to it. So we actually drew that section, and we said. What you're looking for actually is a farm. This shape has a very typical farm shape. Is that what you're actually wanting to build here? So this is a typical farm. So we could build that, but we were not really interested in literally building back this farmhouse. So what could we do if we have a volume that looks like it, but don't want to literally do it? So we asked the committee and they said, well, we think a farm is interesting. We asked them, what type of materialization are you then thinking about? And then they said, well, maybe then the materialization that fits with these typical farms would also fit with this building. So we said, ah, so kind of traditional materials. Yes, they said, okay. So we had a, we had a thought back then of how to deal with this. So we came up with the concept to take this envelope of this building, this outline that we had, and then try and find an average farm actually by logging and uh, investigating and analyzing and researching all the farms in the surrounding area 
and coming up with a average one out of that and an average size. So this is that size after we did that research. And then we did the same actually for the window openings and for the roofs and for the chimneys, how many and where were they actually placed on the facade and also made an average farm out of that. And once that was done, we scaled it up 1.6 times to have it fit the envelope. So that was the uh, that was the approach that we were looking for. And of course, like I just uh, explained, it required an amount of research. So we mapped all of the farms in the surrounding areas of Schijndel. We started to um, put those in a booklet, take photographs and visit them. We started to analyze them to see where those doors and those chimneys and windows would be. And we started to dig up all the drawings from the archives to put all these um, farms in 3D actually, make foldouts out of them and count how many windows they had, how many stable doors they had, and where the chimneys were. And all of this together, we published in a book um, and we put together into this matrix. And we found out indeed that this scaling up was a 1.6 times the uh, kind of average size of the volume. So everything was scaled up. That concept being fitted, we needed the materialization to work. So we tricked more or less the, um, uh, the little committee and saying, okay, we will use a traditional material. We would want to actually use glass as it is a very traditional material to be used. Uh, aside from brick, of course, and thatched roofs that they were thinking about, we chose to fully make it into glass. And it gave us a canvas to see if we, on top of that glass, would actually print uh, images of all those farms that we used to find this volume and to find this composition. So these were the images that we made back then, the first images to try and convince them of the idea. And so the press got wind of this again. Uh, and people actually liked it and they thought, ah, a glass farm, that's a little bit nicer. It fits a little bit better with what we're used to. It still is a little bit off since it's made out of glass, but we recognize the shape and the texture of it. So we went on. Of course, there were also people against it. So here in the white, you see a little bit of a newspaper clipping of one particular um, party, actually political party that was officially, um, uh, how do you say this, institutionalized with just one point on their agenda, which was to actually stop the glass farm from happening. But there was a lot of things happening here in this little village. There was a survey and actually 30% of the people were actually against the farm at this point and 70% were in favor. So we had our work cut out for us actually. So at that point, we started to do the research into the glass print to see how we could make these images of the farm actually come to life on this glass. We did many tests to see if it should be in black and white or in color or pictures here. And we started to test these panels to see about the density and the strength of this print and how it would actually work on the outside because a fantastic play between reflection and transparency uh, was becoming apparent here. Here you see how a print of a bit of a window is very crystal clear in this case due to the ceramic print that we used. But you also see the reflection of the tree that is actually there in the surroundings. And those two overlapping uh, is a very nice interplay of light and of reflection here also seen from the inside in different intensities of print. We started to work on the gradients. Where could we actually open up the facade so that uh, shop owners would be able to display their wares uh, by having these soft transitions in the print so that you can look through it and that you can still have the building function as a, um, as a normal shop. Investigating whether that should be with a dot pattern or just with a print that is fading out. And at the same time, we had a photographer driving through Schijndel, taking pictures of these elements, of these historic places of farms and putting that together into a Photoshop layer, which he put on top of each other, where he added a creative layer. So there is a shadow of a tree now in this print that is actually not of a tree that is there, it is just a print. If you look at these windows, you can see things on the inside, which are actually not there. They're in the print, of course. So there are horses hidden there, or people actually uh, seemingly walking inside of these windows, but they're not there. Of course, they're only in the print. And then we added these transparency fields to have the shop owners get their proper displays. So all of that on top of each other, we got these foldouts, these Photoshop layers that we added to a detailing that was all about having the facade on the outside be as straight and as smooth as possible, as little as, um, uh, or as much as glass as possible and as little anything else. And on top of that, and then we started the construction. The steel was put in place. The first prints were made to test and to see if the transparency worked. And they were hoisted onto the building. Also on top of ventilations, grates to cover those in the skin as well. Also at the very top to mimic this chimney. And also here at the bottom to see this scale difference where you see that the window is a little bit higher already than you're used to. 
and slowly things are coming together. And with this image, which is my favorite, actually, you can see the reflection of a building on the other side of the street. You see the print that is so uh, realistic that if you would zoom in, you would not see the difference, but you also see the silicon seam and uh, um, the, the door actually and the hinge uh, that's, that actually um, well, portrays and that's, uh, that gives away that it is not actually a brick wall, of course. And here, finalizing the roof and the press again, um, coming with their reactions. And this time, people were happy about it. Um, the citizens of Schijndel were coming around to this principle uh, and they were getting enthusiastic about the idea. And finally, the poll was held again here. And you see that luckily uh, the, um, uh, the reactions were switched and almost 70% was now in favor of the building, which you can see here completed on the market square opposite to the town hall and the, uh, the church as a kind of holy trinity of religion and of the administration and maybe the fun that the, uh, the market, uh, the glass farm represents. And here you can see that print and how the benches and the hedges and everything that is surrounding this uh, is also scaled up 1.6 times to give you that feeling as if you're young again, where your legs will not touch the ground when you're sitting on this bench and where you can almost not reach the doorknob when you try to get into this building and get this sense of being a child again, visiting these farms in the, um, in the outlands. So here the print and how you see the reflection, the transparency coming together from the inside. And of course here as well on the inside where the print is kind of wrapped around you. So you have this feeling of being on the outside of a building while you're actually on the inside, which gives a fantastic and very um, strange but kind of wonderful feeling. And finally, at night, of course, where the glass does its job of becoming a lantern almost on this market square where the light is passing through. And this, uh, this beautiful shape, which is almost like a diamond, um, takes its place along the rest of the volumes at the market square. So that's the story of Glass Farm and the contextual and historical approach there. And in a, in a way, a spin-off of this or a continuation of this idea is maybe the project that is up next, that is Crystal Houses. Um, which is a, um, something that I call the disappearing facade, a, um, a project that we've been doing in Amsterdam uh, was completed in 2016. Um, and it was a research that was done along the lines of other researches that we did. So here you see our infinity kitchen where we've been trying to make the food process actually into a transparent um, experience where you can see how much waste maybe we are uh, producing together and get more awareness on that fact. Um, and which resulted in this beautiful kitchen that we were making. Um, a different project is where we started to make a glass floor that could be opened up and then a hidden stair below it. So a glassification of uh, floors in this case, which we continued in a Hong Kong office to make sure that everything that is visible around you can actually be seen. So everything that is done to facilitate you as a user of a building, whether that's MEP or HVAC, is actually put on display. So again, to create that awareness. And we've been Testing this also with the TU Delft further, like how far can we go? Can we make a transparent city so that you can always see the horizon actually wherever you are? And that's, there is no need to feel claustrophobic uh, when you are in these dense cities of ours. So along those lines, the crystal houses can be placed as a, uh, as a study. And it started with a brief with a client asking us to have a look at this shop that is in the PC Hoofstraat, uh, which I guess is kind of the Oxford street of, uh, of Amsterdam. Um, and he was looking for something different and something new. He had a building permit already submitted where this was the design and he was not happy. He wanted something else. He wanted something more uh, interesting and innovative. So instead of having all these options that did not pass the beauty commission by a, a previous architect, he said, okay, can you give me another design, something different that is a little bit more out of the ordinary. So we looked at that site a little bit more. Here you see the region in which the, uh, the building is located. This is where the street is, along which it is, which is actually connecting the canal side of Amsterdam to Vondel Park. And it is an important route. It got more and more important throughout the years. At first, it was just um, houses by just workers, just plain and simple. But at some point, they started to kind of see that they were on this important axis between the canals and the park. And slowly and steadily, um, the houses became more expensive and more valuable, and bigger shops started to come to the area as well. Um, but where you can see that in the recent years, all of the museums uh, in the surrounding area have undergone quite
quite big transformations and have been uh, updated and have been made um, new and interesting again. Uh, the PC Hoogstraat on which this building is, is kind of kept as it is. And what you see happening now is with all these shops coming in, they more or less take their place on the ground floor and on the first floor, they chop away the historic elements of the place and they insert themselves disregarding uh, all the heritage and the context that is there. And you get these solutions, which are, um, well, in this case, very sorry to see, right? There's something missing. Something is being deleted uh, that is supposed to be part of this street. So with that in mind, we started to think about what we could do about this and what we could do to do something different and how we could combine this old historic fabric somehow uh, with the wishes of the current day um, shops and uh, flagship shores that are mostly about, of course, transparency and displaying their wares. So we came up with the concept to see if we could maybe rebuild the old facades that used to be on this place, uh, bring that back actually. And while we were bringing that back, trying to see if we could fully glassify that. So what if we could build this facade, this old facade out of glass, and then we stretch it slightly because we were allowed to build a little bit higher, which was something that the client very much wanted because there was a possibility to have extra square meters. But this would result in something that was both old and new at the same time. And so we dug into the archives. We found the drawings of the original building and facade that used to be here. And we started to rebuild this in our software and to create it and to render it and see what would happen if we would fully classify this and what kind of image that would give us. And we could imagine this glowing lantern again in the street and these kind of first renderings and photoshops that we did. And the interesting thing would be that you would have this, this feeling of maybe being able to kind of see through a building at some point and maybe even see the Vommel Park at some point through this new facade that we would be making. Then of course, there was a dialogue again, in this case with the municipality. So they said, well, it's nice that you want to do a glass building, but we are actually not so much in favor of it. We wrote a document that said how these buildings should be treated and the upper halves of the building should always be stonish of nature. It cannot be glass. So this is what we wanted and they wanted a fully stone building. So we tried to settle in the middle. What could happen if we would try to have a kind of slow gradient and how would that look then? And where would we place it? So a couple of studies were done on how to do this. Actually, we are having the, the head of PC Hoofd uh, on this street as well, testing that. And in the end, we settled on this kind of slow and beautiful gradient. It slowly takes the glass up towards the terracotta brick or maybe the brick down towards the glass, however you like. So in the end, the concept diagram didn't end here, but actually it ended here with this gradient that we introduced and the section that was created alongside of it. Uh, by that time, uh, the original buildings uh, that needed to be demolished uh, because they were more or less falling apart, uh, they had been demolished. So we were um, in a rush. We needed to find out how to actually do this at this point. So again, the research came in. We started very simply by just gluing little bits of uh, transparent uh, perspex on top of each other and see if that could work. Not so much polycarbonate then, also something that didn't really work so well. Resin, we tried to see if we can make blocks out of that. And then in the end, indeed, as already said, we started to look into glass again. In this case, pressing bricks into sand, pouring glass over it to get the texture that we were looking for. And in the end, actually starting to stack glass bricks on top of each other with normal bricks interspersed. And that could work. And that seemed to give the effect that we were looking for. And then we found this beautiful company in Rezana in Italy, Poesia, that made these bricks. And we started to experiment with them together with the TU Delft to see how we can glue them together. And as you can see, we weren't successful in the beginning. Right? There were different types of epoxies used, which really didn't work so well. And if they actually glued together, they didn't really look so nice. So it took us a while to actually find a glue that was um, sufficiently strong to work, also sufficiently thin to work. And it is actually the glue that we all know about more or less that when we go to the dentist and we get this glue to kind of fill our cavities and we get the blue light to, to, to cure it and to uh, toughen it up. That's the type of stuff that we have been using to glue these glass bricks together. And we were finally getting prototypes that were actually working and getting the, the tensile strength and the, the structural strength that we needed. The downside of this glue though, was that it was a very thin glue. It was only half or a quarter of a millimeter thick and that meant actually that the bricks themselves also needed to be super, um, super steady in their measurements, right? You needed to have almost a zero tolerance as well, a quarter of a millimeter. And that was something that was kind of in direct opposition to the factory that was there in Rezana. 
but these Italian craftsmen, they were fantastic and they were making beautiful products, but they were not engineering this in a kind of almost German way, maybe that we would have needed to have it in order for the glue to be able to work. Because of course, these bricks were not as straight as we needed them to be, then the whole stack would start to wobble and we would get a lot of trouble and it would probably fall over or break. So it took us a while to get these guys that were doing a fantastic job here, making these glass casts, to get them to be as precise as possible, to make these molds as precise as possible. And to have here Mario, that is the guy with the scissors, uh, becoming a little bit more, um, well, in this case, uh, secure in how to actually make these molds instead of just kind of, as he did it before, which was more intuitively making these uh, beautiful blocks that they made. And in the end, that, that took us a while. This process was very beautiful and very nice to do, but also very pressuring. But then we, after various tests, found the right way to do it. And these whole batches of bricks started to be created, started to be sanded down when necessary. And we had this range of different bricks to show for the progress that we made. And on the side there in Italy, we had a measuring machine that would actually measure to see if it was correctly made. And we did that again when it came to the Netherlands to make sure that the measurement was also done correctly so that these bricks could finally be produced en masse and shipped over to the Netherlands. And it was about time, because as you see here, the facade was already more or less waiting for the bricks to be filled in. Everything else was done and built by the time that we were ready to actually start construction. So then the next part, we started to, to create the facade. So here you see that we built a lab almost around it to make sure that no dust, no dirt would come into it and that the place would be safe because everything that would find itself in the glue would actually uh, stay visible, of course. Everything was transparent after all. So we started with a concrete plinth, a very thick piece of aluminum on top of that, which was very securely um, measured that it was completely level. And then we designed these Teflon molds that you see here to hold the glue, which would then, once the Teflon would be removed, actually um, spread out evenly. So when the brick was pressed into it, no bubbles would be kept uh, in the glue, which would of course again be visible later on. And so brick by brick, uh, 7,000 bricks in the end, we started to create this facade. We slowly started to build it and cure it with these lights. Indeed, yes, it started to become a transparent wall. Here you see how slowly it is rising and we get the beautiful refractions and um, reflections at the same time of these bricks being stacked on top of each other. And yes, we made the architraves into the glass as well with all numbered bricks, slightly um, uh, polished to make sure that they are kind of a tapered shape to make these beautiful, originally made out of brick uh, architraves that were then hoisted to sit above um, the openings for the windows. Moving on to the second floor, and here you see what I always called kind of like the graveyard, the glass graveyard that we had, this place where everything from Italy came in, where we had to unbox it, where we had to check it, send it back if it wasn't up to the right standards, and otherwise send it forward to the building site. And here the window frames were coming in, was, of course those were also made out of glass, and the mitered corners come in, and here you see where the transitional part between the brick and the glass is being created. And here's the trick on how we did that. Um, the actual merging of the glass and the bricks together was an impossibility in the way that the materials would actually expand and contract. So we used brick strips to glue them on top of these glass blocks that we uh, just uh, sanded down a little bit to make sure that that would be in line. And once these were all installed and the grout was added to it, the final result was started to become visible. Finally, the doors also with their imprint of these panel doors that used to be there. And then the unveiling, where this was the render that we made before. And this was the image in the end of the building being completed. In the street here, with this beautiful greenish sheen that it has with the thick glass. And now the first clients were coming in, experiencing this store and finding these beautiful images of being able to just straight look through it, but still see the detailing of this facade in all its aspects near my favorite part where it's actually so thin, the facade that you almost do not see it. You can almost not perceive it. And now it has these views to the outside in the architraves. And of course, again, at night, when the lights go on, it comes through and it shines through this building very beautifully. Um, MS has now changed actually, as Chanel was the previous tenant. 
and recently they have moved out. They were not the, um, the clients in this case. It was a, a, an individual, a private client. So there's a new tenant now, Hermes, who've done a much better job of improving the upper story, actually, as you can see here. Chanel actually had a white um, boarding behind that, but Hermes understood this project much better and made it transparent so that now the whole of the two facades is actually nicely visible and completely transparent. And one of the nicest things still to see is this. Every time that you visit this building, people are touching this facade, are trying to see if it's real, uh, what is actually happening here, What's, what is this stuff and is it actually glass? And then they're, yes, surprised when they feel and find out that it's actually glass that it was milled in. Um, when there's time, and I think uh, maybe there is, I can show this, this small movie that will, um, will display a little bit the process. I'm not sure if you can hear the sound. It's not necessary, maybe. Yeah, we can't hear it, sorry. Yes, okay. All right, that brings me actually to, um, to the next project, Tripolis Park, um, a project that um, is in the vicinity. It's also in Amsterdam. Um, it is a building that is mostly about the connection between the old and the new again, but in a very different way, about heritage that is there, about uh, a monument that we needed to reinvigorate uh, and to try and find a dialogue with. Um, I'll try to explain this difficult project in the, in the slides that I have. Um, so we're talking Amsterdam in this case in terms of position. Um, here in Tripolis, it's on the south side of Amsterdam near the new ring road that was built there, this corner. And it is a, is a place that has a certain history. So when you go back a couple of hundred years, this is more or less the location. There was nothing there yet at that time. So Amsterdam expanded, um, well, Quite, quite a bit since then. So you see when you go through the ages, it's 50 years later that the Olympic, um, the Olympic track, uh, the stadium has been built in the north, 
and that the roads have been um, improved for this site. And at this point, important in 1960, uh, Otto van Eyck, he built the orphanage, uh, a very well-known structuralism uh, icon uh, in this particular position. I'll come back to that in a moment. You can see through the years that at some point the, the urbanism is taking over and that all the, the grasslands are being, um, being removed. The A10 ring road was built, which has now been expanded, I think, two or three times since then and made wider. And here in 1993, actually, Tripolis, which this project is about mostly, was added to the site. And you see slowly how it has been densified and how it has been taken over by the expanding city of Amsterdam. So nowadays it's here. Uh, the site location, this is the Zuidas, uh, the ring road at the south, and this is part of a big development in Amsterdam to make this area into a, not only a business district that it used to be here mainly, but also a district of housing and of living and of recreation. Um, so what is important here, this is Oliver van Eyck. Um, he built uh, the orphanage that you see here at the top. He was, a, um, he was a, uh, an architect uh, that embraced structuralism, uh, that it was a child of uh, Tim Tem, as he said it himself. And one of his famous uh, um, expressions was that he could see the city as a building and the building itself as a city. And that is something that you can see very well coming back into his design for the orphanage. Uh, so a place that, uh, that took care of children without a home. And you can see here how he used the fabric of a city almost to make alleys and to make squares and to make um, little niches and places within this building um, to have that duality and to have that human scale in his buildings and this rhythm of how he connected those squares and little buildings together was something that formed this beautiful building that you can see here in the yellow. So then in 1993, approximately, the orphanage was actually threatened for demolishment and um, Aldo had a choice. Either he was uh, going to build a new building next to it in red, uh, Tripolis, or it would have been in the end actually demolished. So he chose to build a new building that would raise enough funds to actually have the orphanage be kept. And so uh, the Tripolis complex was, was born that you see here in the red outline. Uh, and when it was first built with its colorful facades and with its uh, nicely kind of scaled outside, um, it was a building that fit quite well into his oeuvre. It was not a bad building, but it was something that held uh, the orphanage and Tripolis together and made it survive, uh, but it did not age very well. So this is a more recent picture where you can see how Tripolis has uh, fallen into decay a little bit and that already for five years now the building has been standing empty because of the fact that it is so difficult to rent out, that it is kind of maze-like in its setup and, and people are not so interested in, um, in actually renting out this space. So history is repeating itself in that sense that now again be able to save Tripolis, to save the Burger Waste House, another um, intervention needs to be made. So another building needed to be added, something needed to be done to revitalize this place. And with this question, the client came to us and asked us to see what we can do and how we could come to a development together. And he was looking for a new building to be added to it, something that could be made for multi-tenants that had a mix of functions, something that was for the working millennial and that had large and big floor plates. And in the same time, we needed to somehow do something with the existing Tripolis that needed to be renovated, needed an ecological upgrade. Um, the orientation of it needed to be improved. It needed to be still in that green setting that it has, and it somehow needed to coexist with this new building that we were supposed to add to it. So we started to analyze and to see what we could do in this location. We see Tripolis along the A10, and it is very clear that it has a kind of portal function. It is to start of this site also of Amsterdam. So it is a way to actually express it very well. It is on this edge of where the site starts. It is also has the potential to maybe become a sound barrier for the buildings behind it. So there's something that we could do there. Um, we saw that there was also a good public transport that we needed to connect to. It needed to have facades on this big road next to it, another, an address to connect, of course, to the bike roads that were there and also to be on this gradient between working on the one hand and residential on the other hand. So we gathered all of this around also to see what we could do with the plot, how we could respect the past and the present at the same time, how we could make a working and living environment here, how we could make something that was iconic, but also alive and green and healthy. And with all these starting points, we started to look at the different aspects of this building. And we started at Tripolis actually to see how we could take these buildings of which there were three, of course, the Tripolis, the city of three, how we could make these into buildings that would function again within 
the current demands of the market. So we started to a big cleanup act. We started to remove the entrances at the bottom and the ventilation vents. We started to clean out the terraces to make sure that they will become accessible and usable again and reposition the installations in a similar fashion to make these roofs open again and accessible and get rid of the building maintenance system at the end, which was falling apart. Inside, we found that the maze-like setup of these buildings would be helped by making connections, by removing actually interior um, staircases and toilet units to open it up and to make these floor fields large and, um, and, and have each other, have people be able to see each other much better. And all of this needed to be exported, these cores and these meeting rooms that we kind of took out into an external volume, into the new volume that we needed to add. So here represented as a placeholder on the side. So then we could repopulate these floor plates again. We could repopulate also the roofs. We could connect the roofs. And we could, of course, green dip these roofs and make them into a fantastic roofscape. And then as a final gesture, we would strip the facades, bring them back, but in a more ecological and a more sustainable way to make sure that the building was not leaking so much energy anymore. So that was what we had to do with Tripolis, but then the new volume. We were struggling to see how we can combine this monumental building and this monumental setting with the orphanage close by with a new volume that could be there. So we tested, of course, as we always do. But we tried to see how that program can be added to it. So a continuation of the fabric was uh, considered to see if we could have this um, system or this structure continued. Uh, we tried a kind of walled city to close it off to see if that's a possibility or an offset so that we almost get a ziggurat type of building. We lifted that above to see if we could have a dialogue in that sense, pixelated it, tried to make it almost into a cloud that was hanging above it or a table that would more or less shelter it or shield it. And all of these studies that we did, um, actually many and many studies, they finally settled on something that was more or less fairly simple. This is a very simple volume that we would add to it and that would function as a counterpart to Tripolis, almost as a, a yin yang to it. This was the section that we made at some point to say, if there is a possibility to have this building hoover over it, but keep its distance almost in a kind of respectful manner. And then in between those two buildings, there could be this place that we can activate and make into this fantastic area. And this was something that very much aligned with what Aldo uh, many times did in his architecture to emphasize the in-between, to always make um, a doorstep, for instance, a little bit more special, to always make you aware that you were going from inside to outside and to have you think about that and have it be part of your experience of a building. So that's how the protective slab was created. So there was this the setup that we know about the composition of the two buildings that we needed to, to keep, and also the view lines and the central area that we wanted to keep. So then to make room for this building, the only thing that we needed to demolish were these parts of the original Tripolis buildings, so that we could make this screen at the A10 side, because the road is here, the very busy road that is being extended further again. So we make this screen, we protect the Tripolis uh, composition. We form it actually to the actual outline that we were given for the plot, and we extend it, so we program this sound screen. We make it into a, into a building, into a volume. Once that's there, it forms this entrance to the Zaitas. It becomes this recognizable element, this ground scraper almost of 150 meters long. And we give that a facade that I will come back to later. And then there's this offset that we do. We take a kind of airbag almost around the two buildings of Tripolis. We expand that and we have that be the part that we chop out of this new building, actually punching out at the back towards the A10, creating a very great and massive window towards the A10, showing little glimpses of Tripolis to the inside. And then this beautiful echo, this cavern is created between the two buildings. And we have this continuity still of going from low to high to higher that Aldo also kept in mind when he was designing Tripolis with its stepped roofs. And then we would upgrade the landscape instead of having it be kind of set away from the buildings, we would open it up and make sure that passages are created. And one passage between the buildings where this offset is, is also going to be publicly accessible. So you can experience the dance between those two buildings and you can experience also the way that they affect each other, as you can see here in this diagram. And then finally, of course, the roofs, as already shown, will be green and will be um, activated and will be made accessible to um, emphasize the space in between these two buildings. So further study was done then on the facade. So on the left, you see the existing facade and on the right, you see the new facade, how we tried to keep the system of Aldo alive while upgrading it ecologically and sustainability. 
doing tests of different wood types and different finishes to make sure that it was now also complying with latest fire regulations and that the wood was actually coming from a place nearby instead of the Iroko that was used before that came all the way from possibly Africa back then. Testing that on the facade, making mock-ups to see how the green, how the, um, the wood would actually look and how it should be treated. Making these mock-ups as well. So this is a large scale mock-up of a bit of the grid facade, a bit of the tripolis facade and the facade that is connecting the two together, the glass facade. And here you see how we are investigating how this cut into the building should be detailed as finely as possible to make this incision as delicate as possible. But also the colors of Tripolis. This is the existing color scheme that is there for the window frames. We needed to find a, um, a reinterpretation of this. So this is how Aldo designed the colors of the window frames. And we needed to find a way to, to get a grip on that because his principle was to have the colors that were warmer on the inside around this plaza and colder colors on the outside resulting into this scheme. But with the introduction of the new volume, we felt that the, the point of gravity of this composition was actually shifting and that the new entrance was made here. And therefore also a new color scheme should be created. And so we did that, we made it anew um, so that the center point again would be around the area where the warm colors would be. So this was the wheel that he had and we, um, added colors to that actually made the transitions sharper so that this beautiful image could be created where the warm colors are now on the inside where the main entrance of the building will be. For the facade of the new building, we studied the A10 ring road itself and we looked at all the buildings that are actually there along this facade and we found that these grids, these repetitive grids that are there could actually form a quite nice uh, blank and non-directional canvas for which this big opening that I spoke about this window could actually become something that is very much emphasized. And this created these beautiful elevations of which you can see the cutout of Tripolis where we would have this grid facade actually be that compass. And then finally, of course, in between these two buildings, how to create that in-between space. So we opted to continue the landscape actually on the inside that was, um, that was there before. So we took the whole area that was all those uh, playgrounds, so to speak, we looked for the routes that were there, this heat map and these entrances that were there. We started to continue his idea of having circles as playgrounds, elements as places where you could gather and could meet as plants and potted areas and as flower beds and continue that all across the site so that you can see that even within the area between the new building and the old, this landscape, the same language would be continued all the way to the inside. This elements was our palette that we used for that. So to get these elements that, that can be very much representative of the outside landscape space would also be introduced on the inside. So we sketched that to see how that would work. And if we could make this in between, between Tripolis on the left and the new building on the right, actually feel like a corridor, like an inside street, and like a continuation of the outside landscape with all its facets. And in the end, uh, that resulted into this our ground scraper here with the offset of Tripolis, if you can see in this beautiful place where they interact, those two buildings, where we make this facade as transparent as possible to have that dialogue between the two become visible. And at night here at the A10, the window opens up and Tripolis can be seen from the A10 looking inwards, having this beautiful window, the roofscapes, the activated roofscapes and the way that the two buildings meet each other and how we will be treating the inside to open that up and to bring back visibility here and improve the wayfinding. And here in plan, you see how that works, how this new shape of the new building is completely dictated by this corridor between the two buildings and in the in-between and how that gives these bridges also to make the connection and how higher up the bigger floor fields start to appear and how the fantastic structure of steel we make in these very strange sections that we get because of this result in these beautiful drawings. And we are now well on the way of building this. Here you see images on the left of the, uh, the glass facade that is of cutting the two in half. And on the right, you see the in-between and how these buildings start to interact. The cores, the big concrete cores, the four of them are currently being bridged by these massive trusses. And the image that we saw before is now already slowly coming to life here at the A10. So we expect this to be completed in about a year's time. It's going super quick now, and then uh, Tripolis Park will, uh, will be opened. I'll continue, second to last project that I want to talk about, Valley. 
It's actually a little bit further down the road. It's uh, in a similar position um, uh, along the A10 in Amsterdam. The porous block, as it's been dubbed, it's almost done. It will take a couple of months to finalize. And here, um, I want to take a step back a little bit to, um, well, it's quite a step back actually, um, to talk about this image that we all know, uh, which is one of the things that has formed also the basis of this series of studies that Valley is a part of. So we all know, I think uh, it's been a couple of years, so maybe even this data is wrong now, but if we would all have the same ecological footprint as the average American, we would need 4.39 Earths to sustain us all. Always a good um, um, bit of data to show, and to emphasize the need for us to change the way that we live and how um, we also build our cities. Um, so we have this growing population. We need to densify, we know this, uh, but a sustainable future is just as necessary. So how do we deal with that? How do we combine the two? So I'll show you a Dutch case study just to get a little bit more grip on this again. So in the coming years, for instance, uh, about a million people will come to the five big cities of the Netherlands through internal and external migration. Um, and this constitutes approximately 75 million square meters of housing, 15 of office, 10 of facilities, and about 100 million in total of built surface that we will have to add in the coming time to these five big cities. And just to get a feel for that, if you would live in the Netherlands, it would make a little bit more sense, but the principle is clear. We have a nice green heart in the middle of our country. You would have to add low rise actually with a far of 0.5 to facilitate this. Or you would have to add three stories to the inner city of Amsterdam to facilitate this new um, amount of, uh, um, of retail of builds that we need. Or you could have to build a high rise zone with a far of six in the Rotterdam city center actually to facilitate this. So that's an interesting question there. Do we build how, uh, high rise or do we build low rise? Where do we go with this? Do we compromise the nature or do we densify the cities? Uh, and another case study that we did for The Hague, we wanted to visualize this more because that is, of course, that is what we do as architects, right? We visualize it, we analyze it, and we make um, these principles clear in a radical way sometimes, but to address the problems as best as we can. So here, a little graph that says that for the, the Hague area, for instance, this city, we need 50,000 houses in the coming time. So you could do that by making one tower, which would be 18 kilometers high, which is maybe slightly high, uh, and it would look approximately like this. Um, nice, nice, but maybe very difficult to do. Um, you could also build 128 towers of approximately 150 meters high. Still quite uh, a big change to the Den Haag skyline, but this is something that is apparently deemed necessary if you look at the growth of the city. So visualizing this actually makes the issue much more urgent and much more prominent. So what can we do with that? You know, we could actually build a ring around this little forest that we have in The Hague, and it actually doesn't look so bad. But of course, if we do this, and if we would go for these types of high rises, and if there seems to be this necessity for it, what makes a good high rise? How can we make it a high rise that actually has the quality that we are looking for, instead of ending up in the end uh, with the images that we all know about uh, that give us high rises like this, or give us cities that evolve from the left to the right like this, as Beijing is doing, where all the hutongs and the old structures are disappearing and making way for big blocks as it is also happening in Shanghai, and as it is also happening in Seoul. And it gives us all these facades that are actually the same, even though they are in different places. And it gives us interiors that are actually also the same, even though they are in different places, and floor plans that actually look the same. So how to deal with that? How to take a different turn there? And how can we introduce into these towers, into these high rises, these meeting places where we could find each other, this public program and a, a more human scale to things, we need light and shading, and we need water retention and ventilation and places for gardens and plants. We need cooling, we need oxygen, we need biodiversity in these towers altogether. So how do we do that? And how can we integrate it into these buildings? So to do that, we could, of course, uh, revert back to what we always do. We do research, we try to find out how to do this. So we did a study called it Porosity, and to see how we can open up these towers and make room for all these different elements. And it started with this tiny Lego tower with just the idea of taking one little block, taking it out on the one side and sticking it on the other side. And already now something is happening, something more interesting is taking place. And if you script that then, if you connect that to the computers and you have these parameters that you can shift, you can start to put in these uh, restraints and these constraints, structural constraints, maybe um, environmental or um, insulational constraint or budgetarian constraints. And you can make these 
series, these iterations where you will slide these uh, constraints slowly from left to right to see what happens to these towers. And we can create these marvelous examples of how these towers could be opened up in different fashions and in different structures, giving these fantastic images and already getting the sense of that something like this would be fantastic places to live and would be great places to experience. So does it work actually? Can we measure that was the next question that we asked. And of course that needed more research. But the next bit of research that we did was called the Green Dip, where we tried to see what the actual effects would be of doing this and covering a city with a forest. So we started to divide the world into biomes to see where the different environmental um, differences were and see what actually would be the best places for which trees to live and what kind of um, properties would those trees have and starting to map out all these different trees that we have, where do they fit best? How much um, do they actually produce? What is the benefits of having a tree in a certain area? And then you could link that maybe to see which type of trees would actually be best fit to which typology. What can you put on the tower best? What can you best put into a courtyard block? And start to see what those um, combinations could actually produce so that we can have images where Hong Kong actually starts to look like this and where Kinshasa becomes completely green and where also Sao Paulo has a nice green atmosphere at some point so that this earth that we all know about could actually slowly maybe transform into something like this and maybe then we would not need 4.39 earths in the end but we could actually do with the one that we have. So what does that look like? What does that architecture look like that is about forest towers? So um, the vertical village, uh, an example that we did here where we made a script where we let everybody that wanted to participate design their own home and then stack that on top of each other so that every home would be exactly what you wanted it to be instead of something that just came out of um, the extrusion of a floor plan. We stack them in different places also here in Paris, in Montpellier, where we made little alleys and little streets on top of each other, or here in Albania, this tower, or here actually in Copenhagen, or in Jakarta, where we made this vertical village out of different blocks that found their uh, sizes and their um, shapes actually in the surrounding elements of that city. Or here, the headquarters for Vanke, similarly, or the Dembe Noor headquarters for a, bank, for a bank building that actually wanted to be more open after the bank crisis of 2008 and wanted to have a public route to make sure that people would start to trust the bank again. So porosity used as a device to become more um, trustworthy and open in a literal sense. So then in this series, that is where Valley actually fits in, in this attempt to open up towers, to make them more porous, to make them more green. And this is how Valley fits in, where we needed to make a new destination in the city of Amsterdam, where we needed to add approximately 75,000 square meters, large floor plates again, lots of housing, um, and large collective spaces and high sustainability standards. So context again, what do we do? And where is this place? So we were just here a little bit on the left with Tripolis, and now we are looking at this area of Amsterdam, uh, which has been going in transformation out of late. Everything has been reordered and one little plot was left over here that needed a building and needed a competition for it. So in this uh, competition, it was important that we were part of cornerstones that were actually marking this area. We were on this axis that to the north went to the canal houses, so the smaller grain of Amsterdam. While we're going to the south, we go to the DTC, so the big office blocks and how to react and deal with that. How to react to this new street that was there with these addresses that we need and being in between working here again in pink and living here in orange, right on the, on the gradient between the two. How does that affect our building? And these sports fields at the east end, how do they affect the building? What can we do with these parameters? And so we started with a block, simple block actually, where we put the shops down and then the offices on top and then the towers we put on top of that, but we actually push them to the edges and to attempt to make one base volume here with a contextual outside as we call it. So we wanted to do something that was reacting to the surroundings. So all these office blocks surrounding it, all the glass blocks with their nice, almost kind of like pinstripe suits, uh, shiny and reflective. We wanted to mimic that with this building, uh, but then also actually give it a contrast on the inside. So we started to carve out that glassy block on the inside and we used the sun and the noise and the shading and the shadows to make those terraces and to make those carve outs and to script that, which I will show later. And then all the way down to the ground floor, we would carve it out this block so that there would actually be the possibility to access this block from the ground. And so this design appeared with a glassy outside 
mimicking the context, but with an insight that would show that this program on the inside is different than the rest of the buildings. It's not offices, it's also housing, it's people living here, it's different floor plans that are different for everybody's needs. And this was a model that we submitted then to the, um, the jury for the competition. And luckily we won it in the end, and we were allowed to continue with this beautiful attempt of giving a new typology to this city. And then we mix, of course, the program in there. So there's culture at the bottom, there's shops also at the sky bar at the top, there's the offices in the middle and the houses here. And all this together gives a rich combination of different functions and a very live and active plinth. And at that plinth, you have entrances that go into the building and give access to a hollow that we have there, kind of offset in the middle, that is an empty space where there's a um, collective living room almost that everybody of this office, uh, of this building can use, but also everybody that just passes by. It's publicly accessible, this grotto. And the same goes for the route on top of it. So from the ground floor, from the streets, you can actually access this building. You can take the stairs up to a plateau at the fifth floor. And this is where the valley is and where you can experience that together with your friends, even if you are just passing by. And of course you go to the highest point, which is not for sale or for rent, but which is for everybody and will house the sky bar at the very top. And then of course the gardens that are there. So together with Pete Oudholf, with, uh, who also did the High Line Gardens, we made a design on how to tweak these gardens and what type of planting we should add to this. And this gives this beautiful uh, sketches here of Pete, where you see that he takes every bit of planter, every pot here, all these shards that you see on the top left, and he starts to design them and to fill them with his plants all the way to the top. And it gives this great view of what this building going slowly upwards is going to be like. And of course, um, by doing this and by carving out, we got these floor plans. This is the North Tower that were all different. So we have 198 different floor plans actually to design and to draw. So it, we didn't make it easy on ourselves, but there is something in this building for everybody and for every different need. So this facade that needs more explanation, how do we get to this facade? And it was something that we used the script for to do because we wanted not to have this standard facade. We wanted to somehow push and pull and pull out these facades to create these special spaces onto which you could have a 180 degree view and big terraces on top. But you could also push and pull and make sure that all the living rooms are actually at the sunny side and bedrooms are actually at the more shadowy side. You could also use this push and pull to make sure that more privacy is actually uh, created, but that also that the wind is broken by it so that when you're entering this building, you're not blown away, which often happens at these high rises, but also that the sound of the highway of the A10 is actually blocked because this building kind of puts its shoulder in there and shields everybody on the inside. And of course, to get these beautiful gardens. And to be able to do this and to convince the client also that the model that we were making was the right model, we needed to make it a per, per, so a per metric model. And we did that together with Arup. We filled these volumes actually with characteristics on in this case, the, the sun hours that these facades would be getting or the, the load, um, the energy load that it would get or the size of the terraces, uh, or in this case, our building code of how much light should fall into these uh, windows and if it would actually be compliant to that. And with these scripts, we could generate this whole series of little towers actually and test them and actually put them through a judging system that would say green is good and red is actually not performing so well. So this whole army of towers was created out of which we could check how well we were doing with our own design. And it was a parametric system that we could tweak. So here you see that one of the apartments is actually north orientated, doesn't get a lot of light. But if we move the facade back a little bit, actually, we know that it will catch enough lights to actually comply to code and it will pass the application. Same here actually for the rules that we set ourselves about privacy to sharp an angle here so that people would be looking into each other's apartments. So if we could modify that and rerun the script and then it will change to a color that is in the accessible range. And then the final form was created of this building. So we have these three towers with its contextual glossy and reflective outside and with its carved out and much more human scaled inside made of natural stone and plants and gardens. And you see the stairs here that go up from the street up to the valley and here on the grotto on the inside with its skylights on which we have a, a mass of water actually that will filter the light and will give some beautiful play of shadows inside this building. And here from the top, that valley, those two skylights and the roofs with their solar panels, of course. 
and again a mock-up that we built. So we started to experiment how to build this building by making this mock-up, by learning uh, where the difficult points are and how to solve them so that when we did it for real, you would do it in the right way. So here you get a glimpse already of how this building is going to be feeling when you would be living in there. These beautiful offset patterns that we made in natural stone and these planters that we are testing to see if the uh, automatic dripping system, the irrigation system is working. If we can maintain this properly from the inside of the building by having windows that open to the inside or uh, through the, um, uh, the security and safety hooks that we've installed throughout the building for our sky gardeners to be able to, to get to these planters properly. So then uh, about two years ago, we started construction and we have been building ever since, of course, and slowly um, gaining height and coming closer. And this is now, I think uh, a week ago, approximately, we're, we're slowly beginning to unveil now the towers. Here you see that the middle tower is slowly being um, undone from its scaffolding and the natural stone is finally coming out. And it starts to look a lot like the trailer video that actually the client at some point made. Uh, where he wanted Valley to be in this green world. And wouldn't it be great in that sense if we could actually do this, uh, coming back a little bit to the beginning of this topic, where we make everything uh, much greener and more green and we integrate that into our buildings. Um, I end with a project that was just uh, launched a couple of days ago, actually, uh, close by for you. It's the, uh, it's the Marble Arts Hill. Uh, in that sense, a tiny project, maybe in, in relation to the rest, um, and where we tried to come back, if you remember, reach back a little bit to that Serpentine Pavilion in a way that I showed before, uh, where we tried to see if we could lift the Hyde Park uh, corner here at Oxford Street in London and how we could possibly do that. And it has a little bit of a connection actually to Valley because it's, um, Valley in a way is an important uh, way of making the cities more green and making that accessible. To me, that's always an important part to see that if you make these green buildings, that there is a certain public accessibility to it, that it's not only for the people that live there, but that it's for everybody to enjoy. And so we did that with Valley, uh, and we did that before also with something that was called the stair, and this was what actually started the Marble Arch project. So I'll quickly show you that principle of the stair, which is actually starting with a very simple sketch made in the center of Rotterdam, where we drew a little bit of a stair to the top of a building that was on the central uh, station square in Rotterdam and we said what if we could actually activate this roof a little bit more what if we could just simply make a stair a temporary stair so that people start to um, remember that these roofs are important and that they can be used and that they can give fantastic views so here you see that building that we wanted to give access to that has a beautiful beautiful roof uh, but that is heavily underused nobody knows about it um, and it was a shame so we thought okay let's make that stair we actually made it work. So out of scaffolding material, we constructed a stair all the way to the top, 29 meters high, to give people uh, that experience to go up and experience that new level and experience a little bit of a weight as well, because it was very popular with about 360,000 people coming to walk this stair in about a six week period and experience the views from the top. And where this was the idea of the stair, um, it was a temporary exhibition, of course, so it was removed, but what if, we could bring it back actually, we thought, what if we could make this connection and make it permanent? And we could take the rest of Rotterdam, like the central station, and maybe also do it the same there and have a fantastic roof that you could go to. Or maybe take the theater or the music hall and have the same kind of intervention there. Or maybe take the Bijenkorf, in this case, the warehouse to, to also activate that roof or the municipality hall, or actually the towers that are close by. And actually the new center for architecture and do the same there as well. And also uh, Kohas's Kunsthal, of course, who joined the party, as would be his Rotterdam. And once also the Holland America line is in, you can start to think of a city that is more like this, connected and more green and ready in this case, maybe also for a future that is a little bit more dense, but also more green at the same time. And how does Marble Arts fit in there? Um, it's a similar project where we try to densify on the one hand, and where we try to integrate green into our daily routines and give new views and new experiences of the surrounding. Um, so here the brief is slightly more vague and more uh, ambiguous. Uh, something needed to be done on the intersection between Oxford Street and Marble Arts, something that would make this district come alive again and maybe give a little bit of optimism in these times of the pandemic uh, that we can look forward to and something that would be 
trying to get us out of our houses and into the city and into nature again. So we searched so for what that could be, something that is more um, connecting, something that offers a perspective, something that is maybe programmable. Uh, we were asking the client, what could it be to have this place become alive again? And of course, again, as is part of this lecture, we looked at the history. So we found out that Oxford Street has been there for a very long time and has been one of the defining features actually of London. And that the connection used to be there before with Hyde Park, a direct connection where the city and the park would actually meet in this fantastic corner. And that's Marble Arch was at some point built, actually meant to be part of Buckingham Palace, but then supposedly the carriage, the royal carriage didn't fit through it. So they had to rebuild the arch and we, they actually put this arch in the position where it currently is at Oxford Street um, right here. So that is the context and that is the place where we are at, at Hyde Park, at Oxford Street, with Speaker's Corner that's there, with the Marble Arts Plaza, all these elements that make up this area. And if you look at it now, you see here this island, this place where the arch is at, is fully surrounded by tarmac, by cars, by noise, and not being part of the park anymore. So could we change this? Could we somehow bring this back to what it used to be before in the 1960s, to put all these roads in? We started to check here with a couple of views right above Marble Arts to see how high we would have to go to get proper views out of Hyde Park and to be able to look down Oxford Street and reconnect the two with each other. And that's where the concept came from. So what if we extend the park back to where it used to be onto this square? What if we then lift it, this park, lift it up, bring this vista, make it accessible with a route to it, have an offset on the inside, so cavern-like hall space that we make in the middle that we can program and that we can add functions to to densify here and then make this intervention on the side of the marble arts to take a respectable distance but at the same time actually open up um, the inside of this hill to the outside and make a make a connection and so these beautiful drawings were made of this hill and this cavern that's on the inside of it and we investigated together with the scaffolder how to do this how to put scaffolding up and have actually green in there with irrigation systems integrated how we could make sure that there was no shade falling onto the arts with this particular shape over both spring, summer, and the autumn, and how we could make sure that all the inclinations of the arts were in such a way that we could actually have this landscape be part of that and could be maintained by either robotic mowers or by people that would be um, like almost like mountaineers on the side of it, these sky gardeners again. We introduced an elevator for the top to make sure that everybody would be able to go in. We made sure that all the safety measures were also included. Railings were there, of course, uh, that would be closed on the side so people won't be able to climb it. And then we handed in the application, which is now being reviewed to get this great new bit of landscape that is actually bringing back this corner that used to be there. Black slide and have this entrance here next to the marble arch and have this great view at the very top over the street and over the park and an experience, I think, for everybody to enjoy once the, uh, hopefully the pandemic is dying down somewhere in the summer. And with that, um, I end this presentation. Um, thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was so cool to listen to all the projects. And I'm sure everybody agrees. Um, we have some questions for you, if you would like to answer them. Sure. Tina, would you like us to ask the question or would you like to yeah, ask? Yeah, please do, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, sure, of course. Um, one second. Hi. Um, so I was curious uh, about the crystal houses, like the uh, project. Uh, I know that it's so difficult when it's some new techniques introduced to the uh, building society, etc., uh, and environment. It's very difficult to find constructors uh, to build this kind of buildings and uh, facades. So I'm really curious how you find this kind of people. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, and not maybe the, the answer that you were looking for in that sense, uh, in a way that the client for which we did this, which was a private client, um, he was somebody that had an enormous drive and an enormous will uh, and an enormous bit of uh, guts, I could also say, to make this project come to life. So um, he supported us in the vision that we had in every which way possible. So when usually you come up with a detail that nobody has done before and you ask your contractor, could you please 
um, take responsibility, I guess, for or you know making sure that this works and that we have guarantees. They usually back away and are not. Uh, uh, yeah, they don't they don't want to do it right. It's too risky, too much liability. And this client was different in that sense. So um, he spent quite a bit of, uh, of effort and energy to make sure that we got as many certificates as possible. So the, the TU Delft helped a lot. So he said, okay, we need to make sure um, that when we glue this facade together, it will not fall over in the winter or it will not crack when somebody puts a, I don't know, a, a fire hose on it when it has been a very hot day, for instance, right? Because of all the yeah. tensions in the glass. So he was patient in that sense. He was very thorough and he um, allowed in that sense for us to do our research together with the TU Delft. And they created um, these uh, certificates that would convince the contractors that it was okay to do and that they could take responsibility for it. Yeah. But there was a difficult tri trial and difficult route to take, uh, also a lengthy one, uh, but necessary in this case to, uh, yeah, to get um, enough security. All right, thank you so much. Welcome. Um, thank you for that. Adam, would you like to ask your question or would you like us to ask it? Um, I can ask it, I don't, I don't mind. Okay, go, go on. Um, I, was, I was just wondering, it seems like all your, a lot of your projects are very um, radical, um, particularly with how they look. Um, I was just wondering if you had any advice on how to try and convince um, people like, you know, clients and planning authorities and councillors and things that they're actually a good idea, because it seems like a lot of what UK architects do is be very conservative and mm. slap a pitched roof on or something, but <laughs> because they, they want it to get approved at the end of the day, but it doesn't seem like planning authorities um, yeah, are that, are that enlightened? I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a. Um, it's a. Yeah. Good question and a, and a very uh, actual topic. Um, we're we're doing a, a competition, uh, for instance, at the moment um, somewhere in the UK that we are having similar problems with. Um, so a, a certain amount of conservatism, I could uh, I could call it maybe. Um, what I've learned up until now with working in the UK is that it's. Um, that it helps to tell the story behind it clearly, right? As I, um, as I did with specifically maybe the first two projects here, once the storyline and kind of the conceptual thought process that we have is, is rooted well enough and it forms a narrative that is more or less almost difficult to, um, to upturn or to, uh, um, I don't know, how do you say this properly, to... Uh, uh, to disregard, um, then you can try to get them to to understand and to uh, to take your side. So um, I think there's a there's much to be to be done in that aspect. So by by creating a story that is rooted in the context and in, in the historical aspects of the site, uh, and maybe actually using that to your um, to your advantage, uh, that for now has been ways for us to deal with these a little bit more conservative and maybe. Uh, historic sometimes minded uh, clients and municipalities yeah okay thanks maybe in that sense the crystal houses is, is a good example for that for instance uh, they were similarly conservative um, but by showing them how in that sense respectful we would be to the original houses they would be demolished anyway so uh, there was no coming back to that so we proposed to bring them back and already then we kind of won over the municipality in this case and the beauty commission thinking, ah, so if we can get them back, that is a win for us already. Us then telling them that we would actually want to glassify them was something that they had to um, get used to a little bit, but they saw uh, what we were trying to do and how we were trying to form a new uh, route where you can kind of combine all the new together because this is something that all city centers are struggling with, right? Um, Amsterdam is also UNESCO, right? The whole of Italy is sometimes even difficult to do anything with because everything is historically important and to be kept. So at some point there needs to be a, a way of dealing with this or an approach on how we can combine the two. And that's where Glass Farm and Crystal Houses come in and maybe Tripolis in a way also to try and find that narrative between the two. And if that narrative is, uh, is straight, then they, uh, yeah, then sometimes they are susceptible to it. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, Mia Drag, would you like to ask your question or would you like us to ask it? 
Uh, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so I must start with uh, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, such a pleasure to hear it all. And uh, I'm asking about your great big ideas and investigation that comes uh, true and uh, have a big footprints uh, nowadays uh, in uh, all fields and the planet Earth uh, for, uh, and the question is about the future settlements for this enormous uh, number of people that you're planning as the example of the pro project uh, Wally. And uh, how it uh, could be it, uh, possible uh, that the uh, economy and uh, the big cost of these projects uh, and uh, all these aspects with uh, investors and uh, structure, uh, construction, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, just a second. Uh, construction uh, construction industry. Mm -hmm. uh, could it be possible in uh, culture and society to be uh, to become uh, uh, accessible to all of people on the planet Earth if we are planning that uh, green grid uh, on the whole planet? Uh, yes, as such. I think I, I think I understand what you what you say. Uh, if I misunderstand, let me know. Um, if you're talking about valley and valley being possibly uh, as, as far as we are concerned at least a solution to densifying and greenifying our cities that's uh, that's how we see it at least then i think it's it's important to see that valley is something that uh, i would call a prototype it is a building that was conceived um, in the aftermath of the previous economic crisis uh, at that moment construction prices were low uh, and uh, for the optimistic and maybe the, um, how do you say this, the, the people that can look into the future quite well, uh, the opportunists, I guess, it was a moment to start to invest. Um, and I want to say this because that meant that when Valley was drawn and was um, put on the market to be tendered, uh, the actual building costs for the, for the building were relatively low compared to the amount of um, revenues that it was created while it was being constructed. So housing prices were going up. Well, the building uh, industries uh, prices were also going up, but of course there was a fixed price already. So at that point, um, Valley turned out to be a building that was conceived at the exact um, kind of mark where you would want to have this building be conceived. Otherwise it could not have been possible. In other words, in today's climate, it's already difficult to build a, a, a building such as Valley. So I think this is part of your question, right? Will it, will it be accessible for everybody and for all societies? Um, what I hope is that in this case, Valley will turn out to be a prototype <clears throat> as a traditional prototype, as in a building that we can learn from. So we have learned a lot from making this actually now and trying to and finally getting a building done that we have been trying to do for so long. And we know so much more now about how to integrate the green, for instance, from the very start of the design process and not add it later because it will add so much structure to your building that it actually becomes counterproductive to putting uh, terraces and green on your building. We know how to be a little bit more um, quick and I guess also more refined by using these uh, scripts that we have made into this uh, parametric facade. So we can use that again to make these facades smarter and quicker and reduce actually the time that we spent on making that. And hopefully in that way, uh, there will be a time at some point that we can build another valley and another valley and more of the buildings that combine these different functions together, but also combine the density that it has with the green and the sustainable aspects that it has so that it can become a solution, hopefully, in this, this porous block to, um, uh, to problems in, in many more places. Uh -huh. I understand. Uh, yeah, that's uh, a great uh, prototype for the future. So we have uh, this idea of parameterization and uh, prefabricate, prefabrication, maybe to have that uh, much more possible in the future, right? Yeah, and I would add a third to it also. It's something that we have been, been uh, advocating and making use of also, and that is to strive for um, a certain increase of densification even. So for instance, if there is a a problem with getting a project built because there is uh, there's not enough funding for it, for instance, then it can help by allowing the developers to increase um, the size of the building. So instead of, for instance, having a building be 40,000 square meters, allow them for it to be 50,000 square meters. So allow to go higher in this case, but then um, also um, include in that deal that they will spend uh, a certain percentage of those extra revenues in updating or improving the quality of the building or the public space around it. 
So also there is a balance to be found to have the developers actually um, yeah, give them a little bit more room, so to speak, so that there can also be a little bit more quality in the surrounding area and in the building. I think there's a balance there that we can use to, um, to also create um, buildings such as Valley. All right, uh, thank you for the, for the answer. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is by Constantina. Would you like to come and ask that question? Yeah, sure. Um, so a couple of days ago, I came across an article, if I'm not mistaken, it was BBC London. Um, and I was really surprised by the comments below from you know the general public. And it was about the Marble Arch Hill project. So the summary of, um, of the comments were that it's a way of wasting the money of the council and that it's not worth of having an intervention like that. So how would you address that? How would you um, convince the general public that an intervention like that would benefit the area both in the short term and, and in the long term? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um... I think when you're when you're talking about investments that the uh, that the municipality in this case the, the Westminster uh, City Council does um, when they're not directly going to the residents but are um, um, used to have maybe uh, exhibitions or uh, artistical projects uh, it is always difficult to to um, kind of put a, a total number under that or to find out what the actual benefit it is for the area it's, it's difficult to capture that in in raw numbers, I can imagine. Um, already now, I think by having this uh, this PR release and having this um, this press, you know, the BBC has spoken about it. Uh, various uh, magazines and articles and websites have spoken about it. Already, the attention for this place, this part of London, so Hyde Park and Oxford Street, is increasing. So people are talking about it again, and people are debating it again. Um, and again, it's difficult to put this in raw numbers, but um, the idea, of course, behind something like this, and that's why it also has a certain radical appearance. Um, I think if you would build something here that you can find everywhere throughout the world, then the amount of buzz that it would create would, of course, be a lot, a lot less. So being a little bit more radical here and having something here that is uh, not often done, it, it creates a, a vibe and a certain um, uh, buzz for this place and also an enthusiasm, I think, to discuss the problem. So that's one that will help. There's, a, there's an awareness that is brought under the attention again that Oxford Street is in decline and that there is something that needs to be done. I was hoping that it would also, um, as a second element, um, have the focus again on the fact that Hyde Park and the connection to the Marble Arts Island is something that can be restored so that actually the public um, benefit of this park and the connection with Oxford could be uh, improved. So that is also something that it tries to do. Uh, and the third thing I think is something that you cannot really catch in, in money either, but that is to, like I said, try and see this intervention as a, um, as a way of um, creating a little bit of optimism, a little bit of joy. It's a funny thing. It's not to be taken too serious, right? We are making a little hill um, in Hyde Park, which is enormous, uh, tiny in that sense, but it is something fun. It is something kind of wonderful that will uh, hopefully entice you to go up to have a look at it and to look over the uh, over Hyde Park and to um, experience the outside again a little bit more. So I'm I'm rooting in that sense for um, uh, for a continuation on how well you have been vaccinating the country and how you've been trying to uh, to come back to the uh, to the normal way of things. And I'm hoping that that the mount and the hill could be a celebration of um, of everybody being able to go outside again and experience uh, new things that give new perspectives. Uh, thank you so much, Constantina, for the question. Um, Justina, you have a question, but Constantina, you just asked another one. Would you like to continue? With uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I have a question about the material, uh, specifically glass farm, and of course, as well within crystal houses. Uh, my question is why glass? As, as it is you value is challenging thermal comfort and thermal bridging around the buildings uh, as from sustainability point of view. According to some research nowadays, it's the passive housing. It's most uh, of the houses are built uh, around it. Uh, so the airtight buildings and uh, so to reduce the energy use. So how do you do the glass building sustainable? Hmm. Yeah, 
another good question. Um, crystal houses may be easiest uh, in this case to answer with. Um, the problem more or less with, uh, with shops to start there uh, in, in a normal shopping street is that they are not a big fan of um, double glazing or triple glazing even, right? So they have their wares in their shop fronts. And if you do that, then the reflective capacities of the glass will be so much that you will actually not be able to see the pair of shoes or the pair of jeans in the, in the shop. So what you usually see in shop fronts is that they have single glass um, and they have all kinds of um, methods actually of trying to keep um, their shops warm on the inside. So they have these blowers and everything. And usually also because of um, legislation actually knowing this, um, regulations for shops are usually quite low in terms of what they need to do in, um, in energy efficiency, much um, lower than for instance houses. Um, and that has to do with this amount of glass that they are um, uh, that they are actually that they want to have to make sure that they can express their wares. Um, so there's a bit of a discrepancy there between how to deal with sustainability and how shops want to want to display their stuff. For crystal houses, um, it is not very much different in terms of that the solid glass does not have a very much higher U value than just a single plane of glass. It's just a very fat single plane of glass. There is no cavity in between, of course. So in that sense, the sustainability of it is relatively low. Uh, knowing this from the start with this concept, um, we strove for two things within this project. And the one was that we needed to know that this glass would be able to be uh, molten down again if this would ever needed to be the case. So can we reuse it? Can we actually throw this back into the Italian oven and get new glass out of this? Um, so this was something that we needed to make sure of and which we, um, uh, we agreed upon to to have be possible. So we, we tested this and this is a, a possibility. And the second thing was also that we wanted to convince the client that because we would be making this facade that would be leaking so much energy, so to speak, we wanted to make sure that there was a certain compensation done. So we um, installed a ground source heat pump in this uh, particular store uh, that hasn't been done so often or almost anywhere else in the PC Hoogstraat. Um, but we made this part of the deal to be able to validate uh, in a certain way this amount of glass that we were um, putting into the facade. So this ground source heat pump is supplying actually um, the energy to be able to, um, to keep the, the comfort and the climate on the inside in a sustainable way uh, in balance. Thank you so much. It was a really great presentation, by the way, because I didn't say thank you for it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. I think there's one more question for Constantina, um, so you can come live. Yeah, so um, it's regarding the Valley project. Um, so I'm, I'm using, for my design thesis, we have um, based the unit on computer generated design and computational methods. So I was looking into Cool Keel as well as a precedent on how to manipulate pixels and create different floor plans and flexibility and variation. So I'm basing the idea that I'm trying to transform the kind of taboo of computer generated designs that might result into a generic city, basically mm -hmm. having a generated form that could fit anywhere. And I'm using kind of, I'm, I'm creating a parametric system where that recipe is manipulated specifically for the side, depending on different parameters. For example, for mine, it was density and maximizing solar um, radiation on the building. Um, and I, I would like to ask like, um, how would you, um, are there advice or approach that in terms of, like differently or any any advice based on your experience on that and you mean then specifically the the prevention of of making a, a more generic um script that would be maybe devoid of um i guess of, of wonder and a little bit of uh, um, originality yeah. you mean and, and also how would you approach the idea of having the pixels of different shapes and the, the idea of flexibility as well. Let's see if I understand your question. Um, 
maybe a little bit by example, I can see here, I can, I can try to answer it. Um, we did a different project that we did in Bordeaux that was also based on a, on a script, something that you can find on the website maybe. So there is a whole city block that was um, conceived by running a script that was trying to find the optimal orientation for the buildings in terms of sun and to um, have these roofs of this whole uh, quarter that was built um, cut off in a certain angle so that it would allow sun on the streets and it would allow the optimal orientation for um, solar panels on these roofs. So even though this was a, a script that could have resulted into a very generic result, uh, the site itself and the context actually made it into something much more special because this was an old, um, uh, how do you say this, uh, old site for a railroad Right? So it had, a, it had a strange curve to it, it had a strange pattern to it and a strange grid of streets to it. So once those two things overlapped, the kind of very conservative almost, or the, the very structured um, script that you would write, that would maybe generate something generic. And the, the context that was much more uh, organic maybe, and much more driven by history, infused by history, I must say, uh, then something unexpected came out of it. So maybe that is that could be an advice that there is always a certain slider that you need in the script that um, that will satisfy, I guess, your curiosity and your uh, drive to find something that is that is new, right? Something that is a little bit disruptive, uh, but ideally can still be justified. So the side is an easy one, right? If it if it directs you into that direction, but it could also be different. I mean, Valley could have also been a building that was really made out of pixels and made out of blocks, uh, but then it would have become something much much more rigid, I guess. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe it would have been the answer to the question asked before about how Valley would look in these days when construction costs are a little bit higher and you would maybe need to have something that is more um, possibly prefabricated so you would work with modules. Um, but if you wanna have something that is a little bit more friendly in this case, right? So less of these 90 degree curves and a little bit more interaction between these uh, and two degrees of 10 in this case. And you could, um, yeah, you could add a little bit of wonder to it. I see that my internet connection is unstable. I hope that you can still um, hear me and uh, hear my answers. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Does, does anybody have any other questions that they would like to ask? You can just uh, put your mic or camera on. No? Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for the lecture. I think everyone found it really, really interesting. And everything that you talked about, like we're taking away like really good knowledge and information that we can put to use in our projects. Um, and a couple of people thanked you in the comments as well. And if any of those people want to talk, like say it verbally, that's cool too. Um, but yeah, that's... Well, thanks everybody for attending. It was great to, uh, to talk to you all and to, uh, to hear your questions. So um, happy to have um, spoken about this and glad to hear that you, uh, that you liked it. Yep, thank you so much. And well, there's lots of thank you comments coming in, so... Thank you so much, it was really yeah. good. <laughs> yes, thank you for the presentation, really inspiring. It really true. Thank yeah. you everybody. My pleasure and uh, yeah. best of luck with the upcoming uh, with the upcoming work and projects. And um, I don't know, hopefully indeed it is, has been a bit inspiring to, uh, to keep on innovating, right? And to keep on finding that new thing and that narrative that you, uh, that you need to convince everybody else to, uh, to dream with you. Thank you very much. The lecture and we'll put it up on our YouTube channel. It's a salsa lecture. So if anybody wants to go back to something, um, you're welcome to do so. so. All right. Okay. Someone asked you to do more lectures, so we could. <laughs> <laughs> I would need to do more projects first, I think, to be able to tell uh, the stories as well as these ones. Well, we hope you do. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much. Have a good evening, and everybody else, have a good evening as well. And we'll. Yes. All right. You too. Thank you. It's great to have you here. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye bye. bye.